Well, today we're going to be, uh, well, I think we're going to finish up our series on the things that divide us today. And so we've been focusing the last few weeks uh, on the part of Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 where he prayed for us to exist in unity. He said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So we've been talking and focusing on the things that divide us. Because if we're going to live out that prayer and we are going to be united together in Christ, we are going to have to confront the things that divide us. And I've, I've felt like there's been three things that have divided us. So far what we've talked about is the labels that we use and the labels that we're dependent on. And so the more dependent we are, on, we are on the world's labels, the longer it's going to take for us, the, the, the bigger hurdles it's going to take for us to overcome in order to exist in unity. Because the labels that we use do divide us. But if we would depend on the labels that God has given to us and made available to us in Christ, those are some things that we can unite around. We talked about pride last week and how pride can be such a deceptive thing and such a divisive thing. And the more we pridefully depend on ourselves, the more we pridefully seek the things of our own flesh and our own comforts and conveniences, the harder it's going to be for us to exist in unity. And we need unity. We've, we've pointed out the last couple of weeks how powerful unity can be. So I have a question for you today that I would like for you to consider. Uh, what do you see people unite around the fastest? Okay, what is the, e what, is the, what is the easiest thing for us to get people to unite around? Uh, is it a person? Is it a cause? Is it an event? What is the single easiest thing for us to get people to unite around or to get people together on? What is that? Any ideas? Go on ahead and type your thoughts in the chat if you'd like. I think one of the things that get people together the most and one of the things that gets people united the easiest is a common enemy. I think we've all heard that before. That if you can have a common enemy, then you can bring people together. And I, I think that's true. Think about it for just a second. Uh, we, we can fill stadiums of 60, 70, 80,000 people all over the country, most of whom will come in dressed the same, wearing the same colors, chanting the same name, cheering the same way, right? We unite with one agenda, and that's for our team to win, our team to overcome the enemy. We do it in sporting events all over the place all of the time. And people unite from all walks of life to cheer for their team and cheer against the other guy. So they unite around that. They unite as a team around a common enemy. Now, that common enemy might change from week to week or game to game. But still, they unite around that common enemy and they unite around that team. We even see it in business as businesses establish a common enemy and get the team to work together against that enemy. You, you identify your competition and then you work together to take them out. We see that in business. It certainly is true in politics. All about the common enemy. And so the, the enemy has a way of uniting us, which seems crazy to me. That the enemy can be the thing that unites us. But the problem is, is that the enemy can also be the very thing that divides us. Just take the simple illustration of the sporting events, the arenas, right? And the stadiums that get full of thousands and thousands of people as they cheer for their team. Those things are divided though. Because there's always another portion of that group of people that's cheering for the other guy. We don't all cheer for the same team. We don't all cheer for the Ducks. We don't all cheer for the Beavers. And not very many of you cheer for the Mountaineers. But we don't all cheer for the same team. And that's because we haven't agreed on the same team. And that also means we haven't agreed on the same enemy. Businesses have lots of competition. 
because they haven't all agreed on the same enemy. See, there are all kinds of ideas out there about who our enemy should be. There are all kinds of people that we identify as our enemy. There are all kinds of issues that we identify as our enemy. And that right there is the thing that can divide us because Well, you know what? Yes, a common enemy can unite us, but how do we agree on who the common enemy is even supposed to be? So our argument over who the enemy is that we should be uniting against is the very thing that divides us. And we don't know what to do with it. Enemies, while they can bring us together, enemies also drive us apart. So it's, it's, uh, it's just crazy. It's crazy. And we get into this, and we see it in the world, and we also see it play out in the church. So I've been thinking about this whole whole enemy thing, right? And what we're supposed to be fighting against and standing against. And I've been thinking about this, and I have some questions for you. And, And we'll talk about some of these questions today. And not that I have answers to all of these questions, but they're questions that I have in my head. And I think it's good to a- ask questions, even if we don't know the answers to the questions. But here's some questions. Do we have an enemy? Do you have an enemy today that you can name or describe? Do you have that enemy? Because it seems to me like we are always looking for an enemy. And why is that? Why is it that we always feel the need to have an enemy? That we always feel the need to blame someone or something to the point where we are against that someone or something now? Like, do we find some weird comfort or peace in having an enemy? Sometimes it seems that way. So if you have an enemy, why? Why do you have the enemy? How do we decide who the enemy is going to be? How do you figure that out? How do you determine that? And if there's people that disagree with you on who that enemy is, does that make them your enemy? Like, how do we determine who our enemies are? How do we define that? If someone disagrees with us, is that the enemy? If they cheer for the other team, are they the enemy? If they dress different, if they look different, if they were raised different, if they live in a different part of the country, if they choose a different side in politics, like, what makes them What makes people our enemy? How do we define that? Does our pride make them our enemy? Do their labels make us, make them our enemy? I mean, who told us? Who told us they were enemy? And and then if we have enemies, who tells us how to treat those people? It's just crazy to me. And it just creates all kinds of questions for me and how we're supposed to go about interacting with our enemies, and why we feel the need to even have an enemy. So, so what I want to do today, as we've been doing the last couple of weeks, is I want to challenge the idea of enemy, right? I want, I want us to really think about that, because I think that, that enemy is also one of the things that tears us apart. Enemy is also one of the things that divides us. So I want us to challenge our understanding and our definition of what an enemy even is. Maybe you don't even feel like you have an enemy. Maybe you don't call anyone your enemy. Maybe you don't call anything your enemy. But I want you to ask yourself, but do my actions towards someone or something, some issue or some person, do my actions say otherwise? Because here's the thing. I don't think we have to actually label someone enemy for us to begin to treat them like one. Here's what I mean. In John chapter 1, Verse 45, 46 has an interesting conversation between Philip and Nathaniel. And this is a time when Jesus is out rounding up his disciples and training up his followers, right? And so Philip goes to Nathaniel after Jesus has called him to come and follow him. Jesus has called Philip to be one of his disciples. And Philip runs to Nathaniel. I'm going to assume and say that Nathaniel must have been one of Philip's good friends right? So Philip and Nathaniel are buddies, and so Philip wants to go tell Nathaniel this exciting news. This is my perception of what's going on here. And so Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, well, come and see. 
I find this to be a really interesting story, and I think it's a story that we can definitely all relate to at some level. Because look at what's happening here. Jesus, out rounding up his disciples, building his team. Philip goes to tell his friend about what is happening and what amazing things are going on. And Nathaniel's response, it's classic. It's just a classic response. Uh, what? Nazareth? Can any good thing come from Nazareth? Like, why are you wasting your time with somebody from the city of Nazareth? Nothing good ever comes from Nazareth. Nothing good ever comes from there. What are you talking about? He's not like, certainly the Messiah or the Son of God's going to come from Nazareth. No, he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Definitely implying then that because Jesus is from Nazareth, that Jesus can't even be good. Jesus has got to be bad. I mean, this is... This expression, this question that he asked, it leads me to believe that, that for whatever reason, Nazareth didn't have a very good reputation, at least not with, with Nathaniel. And we aren't told why. Uh, maybe it's just simply the wrong side of the tracks and the people that live over there are all bad. Maybe, maybe Nathaniel had a bad experience with somebody from Nazareth already. I, I don't know, but, but for whatever instance, he was surprised that the Son of God, that the Messiah, who Philip was talking about, could ever possibly come from Nazareth, the place where nothing good ever comes from. And, and maybe he was told that nothing good ever comes there. Maybe it, maybe it was some tradition within his family. I don't exactly know why. But I know that because of where Jesus was from dictated how Nathaniel was going to respond to him. Remember we talked about labels. Well, here's a label for you. Nazarene was a label, and it wasn't a good one in Nathaniel's mind. Now, now I do want to be clear here for just a second. We're not told that Nathaniel viewed Nazareth as an enemy city. We're not told that Nathaniel viewed Jesus as an enemy. That word is definitely not used here. Please understand that. But based off of his reaction I don't think it would be a stretch to say it. Think about it for just a second. When, when you give a similar reaction, would you say that's treating someone like an enemy? I mean, to whom, to whom or to what would you proclaim that very same thing? Republican? Can anybody be good and be a Republican? Democrat? Who's a good Democrat, right? Who's a Beaver fan? Who's a good beaver fan? Can anything good come from being a beaver? Like, how do we say that? I think that sometimes, even though we don't use the word or the label enemy, our actions can sometimes leave people to believe that they are our enemy. And, and so that's what I'm saying with Nathaniel. The word enemy is not used there. But, but he's not even, at first, he's not even willing to consider this a possibility because of what he has in his head about this person. So we've got to be careful who we call our enemy, and we've got to be careful how we treat people that we might be disagreeing with or not have had a good experience with. Because if we begin to treat them like an enemy, even if we don't call them our enemy, we might just be creating disunity and dysfunction and be adding to the chaos in the world instead of ushering in unity and ushering in the things of the kingdom of God. So how do we treat people? Whether we call them our enemy or not, it matters. So we need to be careful who we're writing off and why. And again, that goes a lot back to the labels sermon, but it makes sense with the enemies as well. Philip did the smart thing with Nathaniel, and he didn't argue with him. He didn't get into a debate with him. He just invited him to come and see for himself. He didn't give a list of reasons as to why that wasn't true. He didn't, he didn't engage in this in this argument with him, he simply said, come see for yourself. And I love Nathaniel's response. Nathaniel did the smart thing. He didn't dig in and say, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what he has to say. I don't want to hear anything that that Nazarene has to say because nothing good ever comes from there. And I'm not going to waste my time. You know, forget this whole thing. I'm not, I, no, I don't want to hear anything he has to say. That's not the attitude that Nathaniel took. Nathaniel went 
and listened. And you know what, you know what Nathaniel got to experience? Nathaniel got to meet the Son of God. Nathaniel got to go and have a personal encounter with the living Jesus. He got to go and talk with Jesus, the Son of God. He got to meet person to person the Messiah, the one who was coming to take away the sins of the world. At first, he's like, nothing good can come from there. But then he goes and he listens anyway and he meets Jesus. Here's the first thing I'd like to press in on when it comes to our enemies. That especially, you know, who is our enemy and why? But, but who told you, you they were your enemy? Who told you no good thing could ever come from them? Who told you they were not worth listening to? We've got to be careful in all of this. We've got to be careful how we act towards it. We've got to be careful who we're labeling as that. We've got to be careful who we're treating as that. Because you know what? If we, if we don't listen, if we dig our heels in and say, I don't want anything to do with them because they're the enemy, we just might miss an opportunity to meet with Jesus. I'd hate for us to miss an opportunity to meet with Jesus because nothing good can come from there. I'd hate for us to miss an opportunity to sit with the Son of God because that person or that thing is our enemy and I don't want to waste my time there. We've got to be careful who we're taking our cues from. We've got to be t- careful where we're basing our information, what we're basing our decisions on, who we're treating that way, and who we're labeling and calling our enemy, or we might just miss something amazing. Nathaniel was willing to sit and to listen and encountered Jesus in the very place he said nothing good could ever come from. Maybe your next life-transforming moment is going to come when you encounter Jesus in the place you didn't think anything good could ever come from. Maybe it's going to come with the next conversation with the enemy. Maybe it's going to come in the next engagement with the problem. And Jesus is going to show up and do something amazing. So Nathaniel is a good example for us. That when we say nothing good can from, come from there, maybe we should, we should put our walls down and we should take a minute to at least listen and come and see for yourself. It's interesting. But the disciples, though, the disciples were in this conversation. They were around this. Philip certainly was aware of it. But not that long later, the disciples would have an opportunity to extend grace, to come and to listen and, and to, to be that kind of person. But they didn't do that. They didn't extend that kind of grace to their enemy. Look at how the disciples decided to treat their enemy. In Luke chapter 9, it says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, that'd be Jesus, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went, and they entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. So when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Do you see what's happening in this? Basically what happens is that Jesus is told, dude, you can't stay here. Right? The hotels are full. You can't stay here. We know you're heading to Jerusalem. Why don't you just keep on going? You don't need to hang out in our town. You don't need to be here. This is what it was like. It reminds me of a time when I was traveling through uh, a part of West Virginia that we would call a holler. In a holler in West Virginia, and I don't, if you've never been into a holler, it's quite an experience, but I drove into a holler in West Virginia to get gas, because I was traveling through, and that's the only time I've ever felt super, super uncomfortable while pumping gas. I felt like I pulled into this holler, got out of my car, started pumping gas, and everybody stepped out on their front porch and gave me this like, you need to keep on going. You're not from here, Right? So I got a couple dollars worth of gas, got in my car, and kept on going. But I feel like that's where Jesus is at. Jesus has has gone into a a holler. The locals have said, we don't want you here, and keep on going. Now, the disciples' response to this is, 
hey, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire and have them consumed? A tad dramatic, don't you think? Just a tad overboard, don't you think? I mean, if someone told you they didn't want you there, would you try to, to call down fire from heaven to have them consumed? Now, granted, the Jews had a thing with the Samaritans. They didn't like each other. The Jews didn't like those people. There was nothing good that could ever come from Samaria, that was for sure. So let's go ahead and call them enemies. And Jesus... Jesus was constantly entering enemy territory on purpose, always hanging out with Samaritan women at wells, talking to them, going in and having dinner with the tax collectors and the sinners. Like Jesus was always purposefully entering enemy territory. And here he did it again. He entered enemy territory, tried to find a place to sleep. The enemy kicked him out, and the disciples didn't like what they saw, so they wanted to have these people consumed with fire. Oh, man. Do we ever make enemies that easily? Do we ever make enemies simply because we don't like the actions they've taken or the way they've treated us? Do we, is, it, is it something that simple that makes someone our enemy? Is it you unfriended someone on Facebook because of something you saw that they posted and now they're your enemy? They didn't agree with you on something that you said, so now you've unfriended them and they've become your enemy. Like, we might look at this and be like, that's a pretty pretty overdramatic response to something so simple, but really? Do we ever respond with a little bit more drama than maybe we need to, especially when we feel like that person is our enemy? Maybe we don't say, hey God, I would love it if you would send down fire and consume them, but maybe we do. I don't know. But look at what happens here. This is exactly what they wanted to do. How much time do we spend trying to destroy our enemy instead of listening to them, instead of loving them? Nathaniel went and listened to his enemy and met Jesus. The disciples tried to destroy them. How much time do we spend listening versus how much time we spend trying to destroy them? Well, Jesus immediately rebukes these guys. Now, some of your translations, your Bible translations, might not have the rebuke recorded because, you know, in some of the earliest manuscripts, it didn't contain it. But in my translation, it's there, and I'm a fan of this rebuke. And I think it fits in with the rest of the things that Jesus taught and the life that Jesus lived. So I don't think it's far-fetched for us to, to put this rebuke in here. But Jesus rebuked them. And he says, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. You have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're saying right now. This is not the spirit of someone that would be following me. This is not what I've come for. I did not come to destroy people, but to save them. I didn't come to send fire down on the Samaritans because they wouldn't let me stay in their village. I came to save them because they wouldn't let me stay in their village. Like this is Jesus' response to the enemy. The, the world would say, let's smear, let's smear their name and let's destroy them. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Let's love them. Let's save them. This is what Jesus came to do. Like, guys, be nice. That's not what we're here for. When it comes to interacting with people that we disagree with or with the enemy, who's, where do we, where do we, how do we respond to that? Do we try to destroy them? Who told the disciples that was even an option? Who told the disciples you can call down fire from heaven and have your enemy destroyed? Who told them that? Who, who are they getting their cues from and how to treat their enemy? Folks, who are we getting our cues from and how to treat the enemy? Are we being told it's okay to destroy them? Are, are we being told it's okay to treat them harshly or, or say mean things or smear their name or, or, or unfriend them or whatever? Like, who's telling us these things are okay? Because as followers of Christ, we shouldn't be looking to anyone else for guidance or, just, or instructions on how to live our life, especially how to respond or interact with people that we believe to be our enemy. We should be looking... We should be looking to none other than Jesus Christ himself. 
And the way Jesus tells us to, to interact with our enemy is far different than the way the world would tell us to interact with our enemy. The world would say, yes, consume them with fire. Jesus says, I didn't come to do that. I came to save. So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing the disciples are learning through all of this. They aren't called to unite around an enemy. That's not what they've been called to do. They've been called to unite around Jesus. Folks, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but nowhere in Scripture are we called to even have an enemy. If you want to talk about enemy, the Bible is pretty clear on who that is. It's not flesh and blood, right? It's Satan. It's our adversary who's, who's like a roaring lying, lion seeking out the ones that he can devour. It's the sin in our life. It's death hell in the grave. That's our enemy. That's the enemy we've inherited because of the sin in our life. That's the, that's, that is our enemy. But when it comes to other people, they're never supposed to be our enemy. If we want to talk enemy, let's talk, let's talk sin. Let's talk adversary. Let's talk Satan. Let's talk darkness. Let's talk those things. Let's talk evil because that is our enemy. But even then, we're not supposed to unite around that. We're not supposed to unite around darkness. We're not supposed to unite around Satan. We're not supposed to unite around evil. That's not what we've been called to do. But why do we try to do it so often? Why do we try to unite around an enemy? And folks, why are we trying to unite around an enemy that's already been defeated? Jesus has already come and handed Satan his defeat. Death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. Sin has been conquered. We don't need to unite around those things. We don't even need to stand against those things because Jesus already has. We aren't here as the sent ones in this world to unite around that. We aren't here as the sent ones in this world to go out and find more enemies. We're here as the sent ones in this world to go out and to love lost people. We are here as the sent ones in this world to go out and find that lost sheep. We are here as the sent ones in this world to be the light in the darkness. We are here as the sent ones into this world to point people to Christ and as Jesus prayed, to unite around him and to unite in him. When Jesus prayed for us to be united, he prayed that we would be one in Jesus Not that we could figure out who the right enemy is and be one in that, that we'd be one in Christ. So instead of uniting around an enemy, let's try uniting around a Savior. Let's unite around saving the ones the enemy is trying to destroy. Let's unite around seeking and finding the lost people. Let's unite around the mission and purpose of Jesus. And instead of fighting against so many people and so many things all the time, let's start fighting for some things. Let's make sure the world knows more about what we stand for instead of what we stand against. So when Jesus came, he didn't come and fight against anyone. He came and fought for us. He came and fought for us. He is right now fighting for us. For us, he is standing at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you, advocating for you, defending you, fighting for you to win for us. He came to be the sacrifice for us. He is for us, all of us, the ones from Nazareth, the ones from Samaria. He is for all of us and not against any of us. Paul emphasizes that in Ephesians chapter 6 when he says, Stop fighting one another, because the fight isn't against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, the spiritual forces of wickedness, the world forces of darkness. And I want you to know that we are not able to stand against those things in the flesh. We are only able to stand against those things in the spirit. We are only able to stand against those things in the one that stood for us. We unite around Jesus, the one who's fighting for us. Jesus tells us a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5 through 7, but especially in Matthew chapter 6, about how to 
how to treat the flesh and blood enemies that we have on this earth because we're going to have people that oppose us. We're going to have people that disagree with us. We're going to have people that do mean things, that say mean things. Like that's going to be a part of our life. But Scripture tells us how we're supposed to treat those folks and how we're supposed to respond to those situations. And you know what it says? At no point does it tell us to fight against. Jesus tells us to go the extra mile. Jesus tells us to love our enemy. Jesus tells us to pray for our enemy, to forgive our enemy. Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek when somebody hits us on one, turn the other one and let them hit you on the other side. Like here's the idea is that we don't treat the enemy like the world says we should treat the enemy. We treat the enemy the way God has told us to treat the enemy. And when we when it comes to when it comes to fighting for our enemies, let's let's change our focus a bit. And say, we're not, you know what, I'm not here to fight against you. I'm here to fight for you. And when we fight for God, and when we fight for the things of God, then that means we're, we are fighting for love, for grace, for mercy, for goodness, for kindness, for gentleness, for forgiveness. Like, that's, those are the things that we can unite around and stand for. We can agree on those things. We, we might not ever agree on who the enemy is and who we're supposed to be fighting against or how we're supposed to be fighting against them, but I'm pretty sure we can all unite for those things and promote those things together and stand for those things together. And then who cares who the enemy is? Who cares who the enemy is. It no longer matters who the enemy is because we aren't trying to fight against the same enemy. We're trying to fight for the same Savior. So now the enemy can't divide us because the enemy doesn't matter. He, it, she, the, the enemy is no longer the point of our existence, but Jesus is. And maybe fight is not even the right word. Maybe it's not we need to start fighting for these things, but maybe it's more about we need to start promoting, standing for, living for these things. And every time we promote these things, every time we, we promote love or we love someone, every time we extend grace and mercy, every time we extend kindness and gentleness, every time we live out the fruits of the Spirit in our life, you know what we're doing? We are fighting against the works of darkness. We are standing against the spiritual forces of wickedness when we promote the things of God. We are fighting against those things every time. We pray for our enemy. We're fighting against those things every time we pray. Uh, we forgive our enemy. But stop making it about against and start making it for. And then it's easier to fight against. Because if we are always existing to fight against or stand against, we're going to find ourselves fighting against the very ones Jesus left the 99 to go find. The disciples were trying to consume with fire the very ones Jesus came to save. If all we do and all we think about and all we talk about is standing and fighting against the enemy, we miss the opportunities to fight for the ones Jesus came to save. And Jesus doesn't give us this example or he doesn't give us these instructions just willy-nilly because he thinks it sounds good. It's who he is. It's who he is. At no point has, has Jesus ever viewed any of us as an enemy. You've always been the one he loves. You've always been the one he's cherished. You've been, you are the one he breathed life into. He's the, you are the one that he prayed for that he prayed you would be so close to him, you'd be as close to him as, the, as he and the Father are. That you would be as united to Jesus as Jesus is as united to the Father. Jesus tells us today to love our enemies, to pray for them, to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, because he did every single one of those things for you. He loved you even when you were still a sinner. He loved you even when you were a sinner that still denied him. He loved you when you were a sinner that still chose sin over him. 
He, he prayed for you even before you ever knew he was around or cared about you or loved you. He prayed for you. He gave up heaven and came to this world and took on your sin and died on a cross that was meant for you, cursed by man, but glorified by God. He did all of that for you. He took the punches and the hits that were meant for you. He's fought the fights that you couldn't fight. He's won the victories that you couldn't win. And he did it all when, quite honestly, we very easily could have been described as an enemy. And now he stands at the right hand of the Father, still defending us, still arguing on our, on our, behalf, on our behalf, even when we struggle to give him a portion of our life or a portion of our day. Folks, the world may say all kinds of bad things about you, but I know that God never, ever will. Because in God's eyes, you are not and you never will be the enemy. You are the loved one. You are the cherished one. Because in the eyes of God, the enemy's already been defeated and the victory has already been won. So let's unite around that victory today. And let's unite around the one who won that victory for us. And if there's people in our life that are giving us a hard time, if there are things that we can't find ways to agree upon, you know what? That's okay. We're people. But we can always unite around the things of God. So today, that's what I want you to do. Forget about the enemies and focus on Jesus. Stop trying to argue and convince everybody else to have the same enemy that you do. And let's start arguing for and let's start promoting and and urging, pleading with people to have the same Savior we do. If you're listening today, if you're watching and you don't know who Jesus is personally, well, I want to invite you to get to know him. Jesus wants to get to know you. And all we've got to do is confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave and you too can be saved. God's not your enemy. He's your Savior. Lord God, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for this challenge to treat our enemies the way you would have us to treat them. And maybe even to forget the whole enemy thing altogether. And Let's just focus on you, Father. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you, God, for going that extra mile for us. Thank you for being all that you are for us today. And if there's people or things in our lives that are tripping us up, God, help us to change our focus today. Help us to change our definitions. Help us to rethink why we're alive and what we're living for. But Holy Spirit, just just have your way in our hearts and lives today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.